happy to be in South Africa. It's my first time ever. I've traveled a lot, but I've never been this far. I come from Calgary in Canada. Not sure if anybody knows where that is. But we have the Rocky Mountains that run north-south in the western part of Canada. It's not the coast. It's inland. And I live on the east side, about an hour away. So you can see the mountains from my home. There's world-class skiing in Banff and Lake Louise, just an hour away. It's a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, anyway, I've been building software for 25 years. I've been doing, I think, what are considered good agile practices long before anybody used the word agile. Uh, I do have a back background in, in rational and the rational unified process and, and many methods. I actually spent some time on IBM's what they call methods advisory board, where um, people like myself provided input to IBM on where they should be taking their methodologies based on what else was going on in the world. So I got an extensive background. Uh, I was with Rational Software. I was part of the acquisition with IBM and decided to leave, not because I've got a problem with IBM, it's just too big a company for me. So I went out on my own and did my own consulting and uh, helped people adopt agile practices. Simultaneously, Scott was IBM's chief uh, methodologist of agile and lean worldwide. And Scott and I have been friends for a long, long time. And if you know anything about Scott, he's written 20 books. and. Uh, when he joined IBM, decided he wanted to consolidate some of his work as well as the work, good work in Scrum and Extreme Programming and others and create something called the Disciplined Agile Framework. And during that time, he asked me for my feedback and, and help with it and helped him evolve it. And then he said, that I want to write a book and will you be my co-author? And I tell people you could have knocked me over with a feather because I've, I've written lots of articles over the years, but I've never written a book and certainly not with Scott. So I um, was flattered and jumped into it, two years of hard work. The book came out last June at the IBM conference and it's been uh, a phenomenal success. We're thrilled with how well it's been received. It's uh, being, tra the translations into Chinese and Japanese have just finished and the Korean translation is going on now. I expect there'll be a Russian translation and probably some other languages. Um, by the way, this is not Mark's book promotion tour, just, just so we're clear. The proceeds of the book do go to charity. Mine go to um, cystic fibrosis, as that's what my niece has. And Scott's go to uh, Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. So it's not about making money. You don't make a lot of money, by the way, selling uh, technology books. But it's about getting the message out there and uh, getting some mind share around disciplined agile delivery. Okay? Anyway, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is the book. And, um, you know, you can, of course, you can get it from Amazon, you can get Kindle versions, iPad, iPhone, all sorts of devices. It, 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 it can be on. Selling really well. Now, the cover is, some people ask me, why did you pick, you know, a sailing boat for, for the cover? And I, I came up with a cover, and I wanted to find something that in showed that when we have a boat race, we have a destination, but we have changing conditions all the time, and that a good sailing team doesn't wait for somebody to tell them what to do. If you've ever seen, you know, the racing, if the wind changes, everybody reacts. And you've got people doing this and moving sails over and all that kind of thing. And instinctively, they know how to work as a team. And this is what good agile teams do too. They don't need a lot of direction. They know how to work together. They know how to be most efficient and they get jo the job done. Uh, so I think it's a pretty good analogy for how we do good software development using agile. Um, did look at some other alternatives though, and these ones didn't quite make the cut. Uh, that one didn't, didn't quite get the message across, did it? No. Agile? Probably pleasant, but that one, well, I've seen some Agile implementations where that might have been the person leading the Agile implementation. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, I'll just say no more about that right now. Um, that one, not particularly Agile. Um, the cruise ship probably doesn't send the right message either, does it? Very comfortable, but, and certainly this one isn't what we're trying to get across, okay? So anyway, I thought this stuff can be pretty dry, so I thought I'd try and lighten up a bit before we, <laughs> before we get into it. So uh, what I wanted to do actually is, first of all, it would help me if I understood the level at which I'm, I'm discussing things. How many people here are already using some kind of agile te techniques in your project organization? Okay, and that's about average. That's that, you know, it looks about, looks like maybe a little bit more than half. Uh, how many people are thinking about it? 
Yeah? And hopefully that's one of the reasons you're here. <laughs> what is all this agile fuss about, anyway? Uh, in, 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 in case you didn't know, there's lots of great things happening in the agile world, but there's also a lot of high profile failures. If you look at some of the English press recently, um, check out some of the, guard, the, uh, the headlines in The Guardian about one of the largest agile projects ever and how it's failing miserably and is in danger of being canceled. Uh, so there's lots of good stuff going on. Some people are still struggling. And in fact, the reason I'm here is, do you know that we, I've, I spent a lot of my career helping people move from traditional methods to agile. Increasingly, the people who contact us and they do contact us from all over the world, are people who have been doing it, but they're not getting the results they expected. It's just not sort of meeting their expectations. So we're going in and looking at people who have been doing Agile actually for many years, Scrum for many years, but it's, they're still not getting the benefits they expected. So we go in there and try, try and help them out. So we're gonna talk about these things. Are you struggling with the complexity of software development? Are you really Agile? Or do you have a daily stand-up meeting every morning so you're agile, right? No, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, are you getting the results you expected? Can you how can you address the gaps in mainstream agile methods? So one of the mes mes messages I have here is that Scrum is awesome, okay? There would be no dad without Scrum. It's foundational, but it's missing bits, bits and pieces. Scrum teams there know this. So they, draw, they go to other methods such as extreme programming to fill in the, get the, the gaps, by the way, purposely left by Scrum. You know, I know Ken Schwaber, one of the co-founders of Scrum, and you know, we just actually talked a couple of months ago at a conference, and he'll be the first to admit that it was never meant to be uh, an, an end-all, a be-all, but it's a solid framework upon which you can build. So we'll talk about how to fill those gaps. And how does Discipline Agile work? How does it fit in? How do teams work together on a disciplined Agile project? How do you govern Agile projects? What do you need to succeed and how can we help, right? By the way, there is a certification program now for disciplined Agile delivery. Our customers have been asking for it. Employers have been asking for it. They say somebody comes in and they say they know dad. How do I know they really know dad? Now, if any of you, how many people here have heard of Scott Ambler? Some of you, <laughs> actually more people than are actually practicing Agile, that's interesting. Um, Scott is a very pro uh, provocative personality. If you've ever heard him speak, he can be very pro polarizing. He can be very blunt. Some people love it as an entertainment factor. Some people are feel insulted. So I'm, I th I'm a little bit not quite like that. But anyway, one of the things that Scott's complained about for many years is some certification programs. Uh, it, the, the Scrum Master programs are really good now. They're better than they were. It used to be you didn't have to write a test. So Scott um, has, has written some things and said some things criticizing the certification program. To be honest, I have too, but just not to the degree, degree that he has. So when people asked us to come up with a certification program, we tried, to get, we tried to learn the lessons of other certification programs and maybe take it up a notch. So the, it's based on belts, yellow, green, and black. And for yellow, we don't expect people to go to a DAD course if they're a scrum master. Yellow is about having just general agile knowledge plus some of the gaps filled in from disciplined agile delivery. You take a, have to take a test and then you become uh, a yellow belt. So we give credit to existing agile certifications. We think it's the right thing to do. And anyway, so you can learn more about the certification program if you like at dis dig dig disciplinedagileconsortium.org. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Agile first, because there's a lot of people here who aren't doing Agile and maybe aren't really sure whether or not it's a good thing. And, and what is the industry doing out there? The state of Agile delivery. Now, way back in 2001, Agile made some great promises. We're gonna cut schedules in half, we're gonna increase developer productivity five-fold, and increase quality two-fold. Now, admittedly, those are pretty naive assumptions, but we did set the bar pretty high. <laughs> set ourselves up for failure, I think, in many ways. What actually happened, we achieved minor increases in productivity and quality in the development of silo applications. The chaos report of 2002, we had a success rate of 34%, you know, just when Agile was getting started. In 2009, um, it was 32% 32, 32 successful and 44% challenged. In 2011, we found Agile project success rates of 67%. So we're getting better, we're definitely getting better. But 
in many organizations, many industries, would we consider 67% to be good, right? We're still not very good, are we, <laughs> as an industry? That, I wouldn't call that great success. We can do better. Why is this hard? Well, things are getting more and more challenging in the IT industry. The pace of delivery is increasing. You, you've got SaaS applications, software as a service, really becoming popular. Even our company, Sky Ambler, we're using, I think, four or five software as a service applications. Um, there's increased standards and regulations, mobile devices, trying to get things running on different operating systems, ubiquitous internet, you get the idea. Lots going on. Um, oh, too many project teams are suffering from a thing called water scrum fall. Anybody heard of this? Okay, some people have. Some people's idea of Agile is they still do a lot of upfront planning. They do detailed requirements documents, big thick documents, go through sign-offs, and then they go in and run Scrum. Okay? So they run these Scrum iterations and they're building software, building software, building software. And sometimes the quality isn't as good as it should be. So they end up spending a lot of time testing at the end and then going into production. So essentially, if you're not, anybody here, you guys know what waterfall is, right? You do you have lots of nodding heads, planning and requirements, analysis and design, and then six months into the project, you actually start to write some code, right? And then you write, it, it doesn't work because by the time you write code, your business has changed, the requirements have changed, and you get into a tremendous amount of churn. So anyway, this water scrum fall is a term that the person who wrote the forward for our book, Dave West, coined. He, Dave also is an ex-rational person who left IBM, etc. Dave went to become a forester analyst. And, and he discovered that that's really what's going on in a lot of organizations. They're doing this big upfront requirements, they're doing scrum, and then they're going through a big test and deployment process. So water, scrum, fall. Not a good thing. Please, 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 this is not agile. Okay? Um, but, do you know what? It's better than waterfall. It is, because at least you're actually building increments of software and showing it to customers on a regular basis and getting feedback and adjusting as you go. But all this work up front on requirements documents, we might suggest is kind of a waste of time because so much will change. The business will change, the requirements will change. Fran frankly, the, it's, it's, a, it's a fact that the business typically doesn't know what they want until they start to see the software evolve before their eyes. Oh, you mean I asked for that? <laughs> Oops, that's not what I wanted. Oh, and by the way, you just reminded me that I need one of these too, right? That's what really happens. And is that a bad thing, by the way? No, it's a good thing. Because it means that by the time you get it into their hands, it'll be exactly what they want, rather than something that's coded to a predefined spec that's, that's wrong, okay? All right, we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that as we go. Getting a little ahead of myself here. We need to make sense of this all. So why is this hard? You know, S Scrum, um, and by the way, please don't take, the takeaway from this course is not Scrum equals bad, dad equals good. That's not it at all. This is not about replacing Scrum with dad. That's not what the title was. Right? It's about going to the next step. And Scrum is about small teams, ideally co-located, one product owner, the voice of the customer, team focus inward. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. But it assumes that the team um, controls pretty much all aspects of the project. They can make decisions about architecture, about requirements. They don't have to deal with a PMO, project management office, database authorities, architecture authorities, Sarbanes, Oxley, stuff like that, right? Is that your reality, that two to nine people can do the job all by themselves and not have to talk to anybody? No, it's not mine. I'd love to be on projects like that. That'd be a lot of fun, right? But the reality is we have to deal with these complexities. Geographical distribution, just about every large client I go into now is doing offshoring, geogra geographically distributed development, uh, dispersed teams, which means you've got some people working from home or in different office locations. So that, where's, where's your co-location there? We need to figure out a way to make that work and still be agile. Organization, so team culture gets, can sometimes get in the way, organizational cultures, the complexities of domains if you're building software for medical systems. Traditional Agile would really like you to not do any documentation, if possible. Much better to have conversations with the customer about what they need and build it 
and build some of your documentation into the code and those kinds of things. But we really do want you to minimize, doc minimize documentation. Sometimes for regulatory reasons, you have to document. So if that's the case, are we gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, you're not agile because you do documents? That's kind of silly, don't you think? Wouldn't it be good to work within the constraints of your enterprise and yet still be as agile as possible? And that's kind of a message here. And technical complexity, compliance, uh, project types, all of these things affect the degree to which you can actually follow uh, sort of purest agile uh, approaches. And let's talk about whether you're really agile. Um, it, this is Scott's definition of agile, and I'm not, I'm not going to read it. But essentially, agile is about delivering value into the hands of the customer early and often. Not once a year, not once every six months. Once a quarter is a lot better, actually, than most organizations are doing. Um, if you're really good, every day. Can you imagine like building something and giving it to the customer every single day? Wouldn't that be great? Do you think that maybe I'm smoking something and that's not possible? Um, it's possible. I was just saying to my cl <coughs> class that I was doing a talk at EclipseCon in Boston and talking about the challenges of deploying large applications in enterprises. And fellow at the front said, we do it every day. I don't know what you're talking about, Mark, because we do it every day. Well, he was from Google. And Google can. And they figured out, some, figured out some way to localize their deployments into production so they don't have to do massive regression tests against everything. They figured out a way to minimize the bureaucracy, the paperwork. I can tell you that they're not following ITIL principles. Anybody know ITIL, right? Wow. You have to write a lot of documentation just to get something into production. And you have to write documentation about what to do if you have to back it out. And you can't put it into production yourself. You've got to hand it off to somebody else who executes those instructions. If you try, try, try telling them to do that every day, and they've got 100 projects to do it for, right? So there's, there's what we want to do, and then there's the reality. But, in, but I, I digress. Deli Agile is about delivering so soft or value regularly, early and regularly. And good Agile teams do this. The degree to which you can do it will be depend on your environment. Strive to do it. Agile definitely is working. Uh, we get a greater level of certainty in what we deliver. Our ability to respond to changes quickly uh, is better. We have improved communication with our business. We e end up with a skilled and much more flexible workforce that has multiple skills, not just testers, not just developers, but people who understand a bit about everything. You end up with a increased employee satisfaction and motivated and committed staff. I can, t I can tell you from work doing this for years that there is nothing more motive there is no more motivated team than a good agile team. And I would suggest to you that their productivity can be four times, four times that of a normal team. My, my teams just literally can't wait to get to work every day. It, it is a lot of fun. There was a point in my career where I actually almost quit IT. I went so far as to actually become a chartered financial analyst. Anybody know what that is? That's a lot of work. It's really hard. But I was so sick of project management and status meetings and change control boards and minutes and arguing with the business about scope and working in Microsoft project, not to pick on any tool, <laughs> doing detailed work breakdown structures and trying to get all my dependencies right. And then so it all, you know, I don't have anybody overburdened. And then somebody comes in my office and says, Mark, I need to take next Wednesday off. And I say, you can't because I've just spent all day leveling this plan. <laughs> so <laughs> denied. Uh, yeah, I was miserable, miserable. So um, and now I have so much fun. I'm so passionate about this. This really is a lot of fun. Because the team is having fun, and the business is really delighted. We actually use that word in DAD, that we don't strive for happy customers, delighted customers. And I've seen it. I see it almost every day. Okay. In fact, we call it delighted stakeholders, getting into DAD a bit. But there's more than the customer we need to make happy. It's your operational folks also need to be happy. They need to be able to understand how to support the system, right? OK, so it's a good thing. Uh, what's going on out there? Uh, Scott is big on data. Rather than just sort of saying, this is the way it should be, and this is what's going on, he backs it up with surveys. So you see here, we did a survey that, survey that said, 
71% uh, 70, of people have succeeded with Agile. So the question is, to your knowledge, has your organization successfully applied Agile techniques, strategies, process, and one or more development projects? Um, some people have never tried, but 71% have had at least some degree of success. So at least in, from this chart, at least 86% of respondents uh, that are at least trying Agile techniques. Now, it's, it's, that doesn't mean they're successful. Uh, all successful. Some fail projects, 55% in this survey. Twenty, a quarter of the people say they've never had a failure. Mm, okay, I mean, that's good, but um, that, that is good. So the implication is agile adoption isn't always easy. However, the majority of organizing, organizations are at least experiencing some success with agile. So it's, it's happening. Another survey shows that compared to other methods, you know, green, green is good. Uh, you definitely have a larger degree of success on Agile projects than traditional, as, as an example. Okay. I got, I got, lot, you got lots, of, lots of statistics, but I think you get the idea. We sc Agile scores better in terms of quality, value delivered to the customer. This is a big difference here. The return on investment and time to delivery. Okay. All right, so people are doing it. It's working, but we can get better. That's the message. Now. If any of you have heard of Agile, you're into it, you're very familiar with this, the Agile Manifesto. You know, a little over 10 years ago, a group of frustrated developers uh, and thought leaders got together and said, enough is enough. There has to be a better way of doing things. And they came up with this Agile Manifesto to sort of, and you know, I've talked to some people who uh, were on that original, original group of uh, people who came up with the manifesto in, in, in Utah. And Jim Highsmith, for instance, tells me that they were being controversial on purpose when they wrote this because they needed to get somebody's attention. They needed to get the attention of the traditionalists to say, we really need to look at better ways to work. So some, about half of the people aren't here, aren't doing Agile, so I'll quickly review it. Notice at the bottom, it's very important that while there's value of, in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So the stuff on the right ain't, ain't necessarily bad, but the stuff on the left is better. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Much better to talk to people and work with them than rely on tooling and process to save you. Okay? Rigid processes aren't good. We need to be able to adapt processes for the organization as well as for the teams. Working software over comprehensive documentation. One of my mentors, Walker Royce, likes to say that completion of documents is not an indication of progress. The only indication of progress is working software. End of story. Okay? So if I've got 10 features, and I built seven, and I could show them to you, and I could ship them, I'm 70% done. What else do you need to know? If I have a traditional waterfall project, and I've done a requirements document, an analysis document, complete architecture, and my Gantt chart says that I'm 42% complete, do we believe that? haven't written a line of code, right? T the pro remember my comment about the productivity of teams? It can vary significantly. There's no way we know how fast we're going until we actually start writing the system. Okay, so working software. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Won't dwell on that one. Responding to change over following a plan. By the way, my voice is a little bit different than it normally is because I'm on the tail end of a cold. And Themi has been looking after me all last couple of weeks, driving me all over the place. He's my chauffeur, and he's caught my cold. And he's, uh, he's suffering right now. <laughs> Sorry, Themi. Um, all right, so responding to change over following a pre predefined plan. Dad extends this thinking a bit, okay? So it's nice to say that your working software is good from the previous slide, but it's more than just working software. It's a complete solution. <coughs> In, in many, if not most, enterprise applications, there's a lot of stuff that needs to support the software, including potentially ch changes in business processes. I've, I've worked on projects where they actually had to change job descriptions because of the, of the changes that the software made. I had to deal with unions um, because jobs were changing because of the software. So we need to think a little bit larger from a business perspective. Also, I, I can think of another application where there were communications people as part of our project sending out releases to both internal employees and their customers on what was coming down the road. So we need to think of the project a little bit larger than just working software. And it's stakeholders, not just customers, as I mentioned earlier. You need to think about other people who are affected by the software, not just your customers, and make them delighted. And 
while Scrum is all about focus inward into the team, it's, a, it's got some beautiful ideas about minimizing any distractions to the team by you know, having one person to talk to about requirements, this product owner, so the development team can focus on doing what they do best, which is delivering work, working software. But doesn't it make sense for people inside the team to find out what is going on with the rest of the projects? What are the architectural guidelines, standards? Are there existing assets that I can get? Existing services? Templates and guideline, guidelines can be a good thing, right? Uh, what I see many times, if, if, if there's an organization that's got 10 scrum teams, is you have developers on teams making tooling decisions and framework decisions without talking to other people. So you might have Python going on in one group and Grails going on in another group, and then you hand that off to a support group if that's what you have to do, and the poor, those poor people have to understand two different technologies. Not to mention, of course, people read, writing stuff from scratch when there was an asset already available to reuse. And so a big part of that is, what is the mechanism for talking with the other teams as well as enterprise authorities? And by the way, when I say authority, enterprise authorities can be a good thing, okay? As long as they know how to work with agile teams. Some radical ag agile ideas. These ideas aren't so radical anymore, but for some people who are traditionalists, they, they, they're not sure if they're a good thing. Do the simplest thing possible and no more. Change in requirements are a good thing, right? For, for some traditionalists, they just say, no, we can't have changing requirements. That means we're gonna have scope creep and all this stuff. Well, do you know what we say in Agile is being able to change your mind on requirements even late in the life cycle is a source of competitive advantage. Do you really wanna build something that the customer doesn't want anymore just because it was written in a, in a signed off spec? That's what your competitors are doing. They're adjusting, right? In fact, in the book, I say that, and it's been a bit controversial, but for, I think for many organizations, those that fail to adopt agile methods risk going out of business. Now, I, I know we're just talking about IT here, but IT is foundational to so many businesses nowadays. And if you're not doing agile, your competitor is, and they're gonna eat your lunch. Now, it's not quite as draconian as that. If you work in a re regulated environment, everybody else has got the same barriers to being agile as you, are, you have, like if you're in banking or something like that. But in, if you're not regulated, uh, you, you probably should really be seriously thinking about doing Agile. Um, let's see, I'm not gonna go through all these. Good collaboration on a daily basis is critical to your, to your success. This is one that I'm, and, and I'm sure m many of you who are doing Agile are constantly uh, struggling with, is getting business buy-in that they need to participate on your project every single day. You need to have, you need to be able to talk to a customer, we call it the product owner, every day ideally at any time during the day to get answers. Otherwise the team slows down. They get these impediments or they get the wrong information. And getting business, who, you know, people typically who are in business have a full-time job. Convincing somebody to take somebody who's got a full-time job and embed them with the team, for one thing, somebody's gotta do that work for them. Another thing, often that business person doesn't want to be embedded with the IT folks, right? I'm not gonna go sit with all those nerdy programmers, right? And by the way, a little subtlety of this is one of the things you might be aware of is one of the reasons people are resistant to that is because they're afraid that if they leave their job and go work with IT group for six months, they may not have a job to come back to because somebody has stepped in for them and all of a sudden the boss says, gee, I guess I didn't need you after all. So you can understand, you need to think about some of these things when you, to help you understand why there's resistance. Okay, I'm talking too much, taking too long. Um, all right, non-solo development is more effective than people working alone. There's, there's this idea of called pair programming in, in extreme programming, where you actually have two people on one keyboard. And I know it's hard to believe, but history is there's starting to be some real solid evidence that two people on one keyboard is actually more productive than two people in two keyboards. You know, it takes a leap of faith. I didn't believe it initially at first, but I, I've experienced it. But it's a bit more than we have time to talk about in this little talk here. All right, I'll, I'll keep moving here. Um, people ask us, what's the criteria for having an Agile team? Well, here's a, five different criteria you can consider to ask yourself. It's more than going to a stand-up, as I said, right? <laughs> Are you producing a working solution on a regular basis which provides real value to stakeholders and getting it into their hands regularly, okay? 
Do you do continuous regression testing? And better yet, take a test-driven development approach. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail in this talk, but if you're, not, if you're going to be agile, you need to have automated suite of tests so that anything you add or change, you can run a test, set a test to make sure that you haven't broken something else. It's kind of fundamental. Do you work closely with your stakeholders or something we call the stakeholder proxy? That is somebody who represents your customers or stakeholders, ideally on a daily basis. Are you self-organizing and work within an appropriate governance framework? So what that means is self-organizing is an idea that project managers don't tell team members what to do. The product owner, the business representative, says, I need this, kind of, this work done in this order. And the team say, we think we can do this much of it. Now let us decide what we need to do to get it done. Not the project manager, the team members. They will say, for this particular, what we call a story, a piece of functionality, I need to take two hours to create a store procedure, and one hour to, take to create the screen, and four hours to create the code, and one hour to create a unit test, all that technical stuff. And then they create a plan, and it's the developer's plan. And that's what self-organizing is. If it's the developer's plan with their own tasks and their own estimates, and it, with the facilitation of somebody like myself, I call a team lead, we can do a sanity check of that plan and say to the team, it appears you have enough hours in the next two weeks to complete the work that you said you needed to do to do these things for the customer. Since that plan seems viable, do you commit to getting the work done? And the team will. And it's their plan. It's not a project manager's plan. That's self-organizing. Not only that, the team regularly reflects on that last point on how they're doing amongst themselves. Are we doing well? Can we go faster? Are we doing some things that maybe are wasting some time and maybe we should stop doing that? Are we, doing, are we missing some things that is resulting in us having more defects than we're comfortable with? How do we fix that? That's a good self-organizing team. It's not a process dictated from a project management office down to them that says you will do these documents in this order with these sign-offs. Self-organizing teams are the most effective.